All right, so let's go ahead and, um, so this will also be recorded. Um, so just, just to point that out, let me go ahead and start the recording just so we have something um, for the record ultimately. So thank you guys for being a part of this um, webinar today. Each month we do um, one webinar or so. And today's topic is really tax tips for real estate investors. Um, our main platform, so if depending on which platform you are on, our main platform is always Zoom. So Zoom is our main platform when we do these webinars. So if you have any sort of uh, questions or you want to view the actual PowerPoint, then you can join the Zoom. Uh, we did post the Zoom link on social media in case you want to get to it. Um, but to express or to expand upon our audience, we also stream it live on Facebook. Um, so Facebook is being streamed live right now, and then also Instagram is being streamed live as well. If anybody has any questions or anything like that, you can feel free to um, chime in at any time. We will leave about five minutes at the end for some Q&A. Um, so just, just want to point that out um, ultimately. Now also, the book Infinite Expansion, How to Infinitely Expand Your Vision of Abundance, which is the book about my purpose and talking about the 12 steps to creating abundance, um, <clears throat> is out on Amazon right now. You can purchase that in the, um, the ebook version as well as the physical copy. So the physical copy is actually available. You guys can purchase it. Very excited for that. Um, we've already had a few people say they, I mean, some, <laughs> some people just got it in the mail today. Some people are ordering it today, so definitely appreciate all the support. It's really a book that's meant to expand your mind. That's meant to, it's not a book that will allow you to think small. It only allows you to think big. So these are big thinkers. So anybody who's looking to become a big thinker or who's looking to expand their mindset as it relates to these things, um, this would be a great, a great book for you. So with that being said, let's... Um, Let's get into the presentation. And it looks like everybody on Zoom is muted, which is good. So that's one thing that we always like to point out as a housekeeping item. If you're not speaking, we do ask that you mute yourself. If you do have a question, you can simply unmute yourself or you can type in a chat box. Um, for Facebook and Instagram, you can just basically type into the chat box any questions that you have and I'll get to it. Um, throughout the presentation. At the end, we will leave about five minutes for Q&A if we have time. Um, but let's go ahead and get into the agenda. So, um, I'll start by introducing who I am, my purpose on this planet. Then we'll talk about asset protection. So I know this is a tax tips webinar, but it defeats the purpose if we don't talk about how to properly protect your assets, which ties directly back to the taxes. We'll talk about some tax deductions, so different write-offs that you can take advantage of depreciation, the biggest D word on the planet, um, tax strategies. So we'll, we'll talk through um, some specific tax strategies that you can utilize as it relates to selling your real estate and also um, when you hold real estate. And then we'll talk about tracking profits. What software can you use in order to track your profits? Um, and then as mentioned before, if you have a question, please feel free to type in a chat box or if you're on Zoom, you can unmute yourself. Um, but we will have a formal Q&A at the end. We'll leave about three to five minutes for Q&A if we have time. So let's go into the next slide here. So who am I? My name is Jeff Badu. I'm a licensed certified public accountant, CPA for short. I graduated from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in accounting. Um, I'm a parallel entrepreneur and a wealth multiplier. I'm the founder and CEO of Badu Enterprises LLC, which is a multinational conglomerate in the finance industry. What we do is we provide a suite of financial services, including um, our marquee company, which is Badu Tax Services. And that does tax preparation, planning, and representation for individuals and businesses across all 50 states in the U.S. And we also have clients in about 15 countries at the moment. On top of that, um, I'm also a real estate investor through Badu Investments LLC, where we own and operate multifamily units, um, primarily on the south side of Chicago. What we do is we buy and we hold the real estate. So we don't flip, we don't wholesale, we don't do any of that stuff. We buy real estate. 
that's in a good um, in, a, in a decent location where we can essentially take over the management and start collecting cash flow so our number one thing when it comes to real estate is cash flow um, that's what we're primarily concerned about we don't do any single families condos we consider that a waste of time and money so for us, uh, what we do is we're in anywhere from 10, anywhere from 10 to 50 units right now, which we scale up every year. Um, so that's our acquisition range right now. It's anywhere from 10, 10 to 50 units. That's our sweet spot as far as acquisitions are concerned. The reason why we do that is because that's the point where it makes sense for us to do the investment since down payments can be pretty steep. You're looking at about 25%, 20 to 25% down payment on your deal. Um, so for us, we're not going to get into a deal that's not really cash flowing in a major way. Um, so that's, that's the philosophy behind why we only invest in 10 to 50 units right now. And over the next five years, we'll scale up to the 50 to 100 units. And we'll probably stop at the 100 unit mark, um, depending on how the market turns out and everything like that. The reason why we're here today is because I'm very passionate about financial literacy. So I love to help people as it relates to their money. Um, just really just talking through money, helping them get their money right. Um, I own the Badu Foundation, which will officially be launched later this month. So we're working on finalizing the paperwork and everything like that. So the Badu Foundation will be launched this month and we'll be doing our four week financial literacy program starting next month. Um, and my purpose in life is to inspire and support the super hungry to take hold of infinite resources in order to create an abundant lifestyle. If you wanna know what that means, grab the book Infinite Expansion and it explains it step by step in 12 steps um, in the book. So let's talk about real estate. Now, one thing I see among a lot of people, a lot of investors is people try to cut corners. They try to cut way, way too many corners. When in the game of real estate, and it is truly a game, just like life, life is a game. You just have to learn how to play it right. In the game of real estate, you have to know what you're doing. You can't cut corners. If somebody gives you advice and you know that advice sounds pretty good, then you're better off taking that advice than not taking it. And let me give you some advice today. You need to protect your real estate. You should never own a single piece of property in your personal name, never. Because the problem is real estate is a very, very lawsuit heavy industry. Lawsuit heavy, people will sue you. I've been sued before, not in real estate per se, but I've been sued in general. And I have clients who've literally lost everything because they didn't properly protect themselves. So if you, do, if you own real estate today, you should have it protected. Um, Preferably in a land trust, which we'll talk about in a second, but you would also, if it's an investment property, want to shield it with an LLC or limited liability company. Now, I do have, um, there's a question here. I, I always like to get to the questions just so I don't forget them. Um, Barbara says, for me trying to start off in real estate, should I start off small with like a 46 unit or 426 unit, sorry. And would you recommend me getting a real estate license in order to be more educated in real estate? So yeah, in general, the way that I recommend clients or folks start off in real estate is to get a, um, a four unit building utilizing the FHA loan. And you might be wondering, well, how do you protect that? You do a quick claim deed from your name basically into the LLC if they allow you to, to do a land trust and even better. Um, but yeah, you would start off. So when you're starting real estate, so the reason why I said we're only in a 10 to 50 unit space is because we've been at this for quite some time now. We started off with single family homes. We started off wholesaling, but now we're at the stage where wholesaling doesn't make any sense for us to do. Flipping makes no sense for us to do. Instead, what we do is we buy and hold long-term residential rental properties, 10 to 50 units, and we rent them out to tenants for stable cash flow or income. Um, we basically go into a building and we improve the management. We, we, we put our management systems in place so that we can improve the cash flow, that way we can improve the value of the property, that way five to seven years we can sell it, we can continuously hold on to it, we can do whatever with the property. But yeah, it's typically best to start off with a four unit, that's the max you can do on an FHA loan, Federal Housing Administration loan, which allows you to buy up to a four unit 
with as little as three and a half percent down payment. Um, very doable and highly recommended when you're starting in real estate. Um, should you get a real estate license? It depends. If you want to be a full-time real estate investor, then yes. If not, then no, you don't have any business getting a real estate license. You should only get a real estate license if you plan for it to be your full-time gig. So if you're a nurse, then I would not expect you to have a real estate license. It would just distract what you're doing mainly. Real estate is meant to be a passive asset. For some reason, some people have flipped real estate into this whole active thing where they're, they're flipping and they're, they're traveling to the property. They make it seem as if you have to actually do a lot of work on real estate, which is not true. The Most of the work comes up front when you're buying the real estate. Not necessarily when you're managing the real estate. When you when you have the real estate, you have a management team in place that you pay them anywhere from six to ten percent and no higher than that, so that they can effectively manage your property. And you, as the CEO of that building, need to make sure you're checking in on those comp on those um, property managers. So that's another thing. We don't we we don't just leave for a year, come back, and then that's it. No, absolutely not. We want to make sure that we actually watch out. We actually, we actually look at just like the CEO of Apple knows how how much um, or the performance level of his company. It's the same here. Just because we get a property manager doesn't mean we just kick back and relax. I have a client today who said that um, he's going to get a property manager, but he's going to leave it to them to do the bookkeeping. I'm like, no, no, no. You have to have a separate um, segregation of duties, a separate person doing your bookkeeping. And then you oversee those two people or those two functions. So in your real estate business, you have your acquisition team, which could be you and your real estate agent. It could also be your, um, your management team. And then you also have your finance team. So you need to have at least those three departments in order to successfully run your real estate business. Um, so definitely appreciate the question, but let's, let's get deeper into the entity structures. Um, so LLC, S corporation, and C corp. Those are the three main entity types. LLC is um, limited liability company. Basically, gives you the ability to protect your personal assets. Meaning that if somebody were to sue you and you were doing things in your business name, they could not attach to your personal assets or your personal property. Um, it's very flexible, easy to set up, very cost effective. No, I mean it's not high maintenance like a corporation. Um, so I like the LLC because it, it has a lot of benefits, um, to it. And we'll, we'll go through some more in a second, but there's LLC and then there's a corporation in general. You should never own real estate in a corporation because there's a thing called built in capital gains taxes. And then also corporations are much, much more, uh, maintenance heavy. So they're, they do require a lot of maintenance, um, meaning that corporate records and, um, stockholder certificate and things of that nature. It's just a much more complicated structure than an LLC limited liability company. So if, and you guys should be taking notes, by the way, as you're watching this, this doesn't mean anything if you're not taking any notes, but an LLC, a limited liability company basically is the entity of choice as it relates to real estate. If anybody tells you any different, I want to see that person. Um, and when we talk about real estate, we're talking about the physical asset. We're talking about rental properties mainly here. We're not talking about flipping or wholesaling. We're talking about when you own the property that you that you plan and intend to hold it for a long period of time, relatively long period of time, at least five years. So why you should put your real estate in entity? Well, you don't want to get sued and lose all your money. It protects your personal assets. Meaning if somebody were to sue you if somebody were to sue you, basically they would have to sue the LLC and the LLC legally protects your personal assets, meaning they cannot attach to your personal assets. As long as you're not doing what's called piercing the corporate veil, meaning that if you were to accept checks in your personal name, you should never do that. If you're paying bills in your personal name, you should never do that or paying it out of your personal bank account. That's a big no, no. Everything should be flowing through your LLC. Everything should be flowing through your business. As a matter of fact, your tenants should not even know that you are the owner of the property. They can know that your LLC owns the property, but they should not know that you as an individual owns the property. LLC also enhances your credibility. Um, it basically just makes you look more serious. It, 
it, it just gives you that enhanced. Like if a tenant is dealing with a company, they tend to take it much more serious than an individual. Um, easier access to capital. You cannot get a commercial loan without an entity. So for example, these 10 to 50 units that we're doing right now, it's typically requires 25% down payment and it also requires a business entity that's in place. So an LLC, for example, you cannot get a commercial loan in your personal name. So if you want, if you want to scale and grow, you cannot do things in your personal name at all. Um, that is a big fact. So when is the best time to get your LLC going? It is right now. It's, it was yesterday, as a matter of fact. Um, everybody on this call, everybody that's listening right now should have an LLC. Like, even if it's for your family or even if it's like an LLC that you're just having just to have a business. Right? Get, get an LLC, get something in place. That way you can start building business credit, build some history. As we know, SBA loans and things of that nature have come out. And the first people that are getting it are usually the LLCs and the INCs. And, and basically people who, are, who have their things in order as a business. Um, of course, independent contractors and sole proprietorships can now get um, SBA loans. But moving forward in the future, that's not, that's not something that's very typical. Uh, benefits of an LLC, it avoids the built-in capital gains tax. So when you transfer the property the title or anything like that, you don't have to deal with any built-in gains tax. Um, there's no FICA tax either. So when you rent properties, like when you rent real estate, the reason why we don't put real estate in S Corp is because there's no FICA tax on passive income. FICA tax is social security tax, which is about 15% for those who are self-employed. It's easy and low maintenance. So uh, very easy to manage, very easy to set up. You can set up a series LLC for multiple properties, although it's not recommended. The reason why is that series LLCs are not recognized um, nationally, meaning that a tenant or whoever it is can take you to the Supreme Court and take everything you have within that series LLC. So typically the way we set up uh, real estate is that we have separate LLCs for each building. So 123 Main Street has its own 123 Main Street LLC. 124 Main Street has its own 124 Main Street LLC. So don't cut corners. Don't say, oh yeah, can I put two in one? No. You can, but you can't. Meaning you should not do that. Because if they sue you in one, they can get the other. Why would you want to expose yourself like that when all it cost you was a, a few hundred bucks to set up an LLC? Um, and then, for those that are wondering, what well, I bought my property, my personal name, what can I do? You can do what's called a quick claim deed, Q-U-I-T, not Q-U-I-C-K, a quick claim deed um, that allows you to deed the property from your personal name into the LLC after closing, um, or preferably, it's best to start off with the contract not being in your personal name for privacy reasons and for asset protection reasons. So that is one thing that I would like to point out is that you do ultimately um, want to make sure that your property is in an LLC. So what, what's the key takeaway from the slide? Make sure your property is in an LLC. Do not expose yourself and buy real estate in your personal name. It is a big no-no. Don't cut corners. Don't say, oh yeah, I just have a few things. You know, um, those lawsuits do hurt. Like, they do hurt. I have a client who literally lost everything because he did not have his property in an LLC when a judge found out or when a tenant found out that everything was in his personal name it was it was fair game from there he literally his net worth at the time was three million dollars it dropped down to zero in a matter of months after the lawsuit because a tenant took everything he owned I would hate for that to happen to anybody just because you didn't spend a few hundred bucks to get these things set up um, it is very, very, very important. I'm not even an attorney. Right? I'm an accountant, but asset protection is of the utmost importance. You have to be careful in this game of real estate. I know it because we own quite a, quite a few buildings. Um, and we've been in this game for quite some time. We know how tenants can be. And we know how people can abuse um, certain laws and certain codes and things of that nature. And I'll get to, I, I do see a question came up in the chat box. We'll get to that one at the end. Um, but a question did come up. Does the mortgage company have any issues with the quick claim deed? Absolutely not. They shouldn't because you're still on the hook for the mortgage. I haven't seen a mortgage company have an issue with the quick claim deed. You're still on the hook. So you still got to pay the money no matter what. 
A quick claim deed is simply a, a title assignment to another entity. That's all it is. The loan doesn't change. Um, nothing changes other than the fact that you're adding your LLC to the title. Um, but it is very important though. Very important. Now, how do you take things to the next level? You set up a land trust. A land trust helps add another layer of asset protection. So basically, when somebody sues your LLC, guess what? And it has the building, they can take the building. How do you protect the building itself? You set up a land trust. And in states like the state of Illinois and Texas, a land trust allows you to create what's called inside and outside protection. Meaning that the land, the building itself, if somebody were to sue you, sue the LLC, they could not take the building itself. All right, so not only can they not take what you own personally, but they can't. They cannot also take what you, the building itself, what the LLC owns. So, the structure is like this. Ideally, the real estate would be titled. So the owner of the real estate, if somebody were to go on public record, the owner of the property would show Chicago um, Chicago Land Trust title um, Land Trust number one two three four five Main Street. So Chicago title land trust number and whatever the land trust number is. So the tenant would not know who owns the property. They see it's, it's in the land trust. Believe it or not, just doing that alone makes people scared to sue you. They're like, wow, okay, well, I mean, what if he doesn't own this property? What if it's somebody else? Um, so have it in a land trust. Land trust creates privacy, meaning that nobody will ever know that you actually own the property. That's the way that we tend to set up our real estate now is... The property would be titled in the land trust and the beneficiary of the land trust is the LLC. The beneficiary of the LLC is basically yourself. Um, or to take it a step further, which is way beyond the scope of this presentation, a revocable living trust. And that's to basically have things passed down to your kids. Um, very, very seamless. That's something that Prince didn't have. So he basically lost a lot when he passed away and went through probate. Um, so it's very important to set up these things. You don't set up these things later when you become big or anything like that. But you set up these things when you are starting out, actually. Like the best time to get these things going is now when you're starting. But the, LO, the land trust LLC structure creates inside and outside protection, meaning that not only can they not sue you personally and take what you have, they also can't take the building. So if, a, if you have a million dollar building, and a tenant slips and falls, busts their head, and they sue you for a, a million five, well, the judge might rule it and say, okay, well, you got a million five, but now let's go try to go after some assets. The judge will look at the, the document. Well, first of all, it's in an LOC. The LOC, you can't sue the person personally. Then the judge finds out the property is in a land trust. Well, you can't sue a land trust or you cannot attach a judgment to a land trust in states like Illinois. So that tenant, guess what? They don't get anything. Um, somebody asked a question, what's the cost to set up an LLC? It's typically between five, um, 500 to 750. What's the cost to set up a land trust? Pretty similar, 500 to 750. You're looking at anywhere from 1,500 to $2,000 total to get all these things set up. Um, for a million dollar building, trust me, that is well worth it. And even if you got a small condo, it's also worth it too because you don't want to lose the condo. Um, so any building that you buy, land trust, LLC, if you can. If the lender doesn't allow you to do a land trust, then at a minimum do the LLC. And the only reason why a lender will not allow you to do an LLC is if it's a personal loan. Typically nowadays for us in our firm and Badu Investments, we only do commercial loans. We don't do any residential loans anymore. So everything must be in an LLC anyway. So they're forcing us to put an LLC, which helps us out tremendously. Um, now, tax deductions and write-offs. <clears throat> so when it comes to taxes, you utilize the Schedule E for rental real estate. Um, so basically, the Schedule E is what you're going to use for rental real estate. Um, and then also utilize the, the Schedule C or the Schedule D for flips. You know, so that's another thing to keep in mind. And I do appreciate, Evie said, I appreciate you giving game. My post was just to warn people to please ask your lender about the process. Yeah, absolutely. But I guarantee you there's not a single lender out there right now that would have a problem with you doing a quick claim deed. In the history of real estate, there's only been maybe two two cases that I'm aware of, and even my, my own attorney who does over 
3,000 transactions every year. There's only two in the history of real estate that he's found that's had a problem. So will you have a problem? Absolutely not. Yeah, you should certainly read your, your documents and, the, and the, the attorney will read the loan documents too. Um, the reason why a quick claim deed is not a problem is because you're still on the hook for the loan. So it's not anything to be super concerned about. But always check with your lender just in case. Um, so utilize, so if you're a flipper, utilize Schedule C. If you do maybe three or more flips in a year, you do a Schedule C where you have to pay the self-employment tax. And then if it's maybe one or two, then you do the Schedule D, which you don't have to pay any self-employment tax. Um, you can basically write off virtually all expenses tied to the building. So mortgage interest, property taxes, uh, repairs or certain types, maintenance, utilities, mileage. So anytime you travel to the property, you should be keeping track of your miles. Um, travel, so you can claim, you can do board meetings out of town and out of state and all that good stuff. Um, and then also depreciation. So that's that's another thing to, to keep in mind. Um, and yeah, we do have another comment. Says there can be some predator lenders that try to force the do on sale clause. Yeah, it's, it, in the history of real estate, I've seen it only happen twice. And that was back in the day, as a matter of fact. So nothing major to worry about once again. Um, so you can write off virtually every expense tied to the building. Um, so anything, like literally, some people ask, well, I spend money on utilities. Well, of course, if it... If it's tied to the building and you rented out that building and you spent money for rental purposes, then yes, that is a tax deduction. So the rule of thumb, if you spend money on it and it was related to the, the business function or the real estate, then yes, absolutely. You should be writing off that expense. Um, now let's talk about the biggest D word on the planet, which is depreciation. This is where it gets really, really sweet. And this is the part where attention definitely needs to be paid because it is pretty complicated. Um, depreciation is basically a method that allows you to take a tax deduction um, over a set period of years. So you take the purchase price. Um, so let me just give you guys a few examples. Basically what you do is you take the purchase price of the building and you essentially divided by, for residential property, it's 27 and a half years. Um, so you do, so let's just say you bought a building, let's keep it real simple. You bought a building for $100,000. You divide it by 27.5. Well, that's $3,636 every year as a tax deduction. So you get an automatic tax write-off of $3,636. So it's the purchase price of the building plus closing costs, minus land. You always gotta take away land. Land is typically 10 to 20% of the building um, divided by 27.5. If it's commercial, it's 39 years. So it's an automatic tax write-off. 99% of my real estate tax clients don't pay any income taxes on their real estate because of the big D word called depreciation. Now, it gets sweeter because you might be wondering, okay, well, if I write off all these things, well, won't I get disqualified for mortgages? A good lender, or the lenders that I know, and if you guys need referrals to good lenders, and I mean lenders that won't do do on sale clause and um, they won't add back depreciation, all those things I can definitely, um, base, I can refer you to, I can point you in the right direction of somebody. So basically, <clears throat> the lender will add back the depreciation of 3,636 back to your income so that you can get qualified. So you're basic in a way you can double dip here. So in a way you can basically say that 3636 in reality was not an expense, but it was simply an add back, a depreciation add back. Uh, meaning that you claim this deduction and they will add it back to your income. Now in 2017, there was a tax reform that came out, the new tax, um, tax cuts and jobs act. Um, that allowed you to do what's called bonus depreciation <clears throat> on certain items. At first, you could not claim bonus depreciation on um, a lot of real estate items, for example, roof and all these other things. But now you can actually claim bonus depreciation and write off things in the first year. Um, to keep it simple, we actually use an expert. 
we use what's called a cost segregation expert. So let's go through an example. Let's say that you're a real estate agent um, and there are certain caps which are beyond the scope of this presentation. So I won't, I won't let it get too complicated, but let's say you're a real estate agent <clears throat> and you did, um, you did $75,000 in, in commissions and you had $25,000 worth of business expenses. Well, that leaves you with $50,000 in net profit. Your taxable income, let's just say it would be about 15,000 or so. However, let's say you bought a building for $100,000 and you only put down three and a half percent. You did a cost segregation study that allowed you to accelerate the depreciation up to 50% of the building. So now you can claim up to 50% as a tax deduction so 50,000 minus 50,000 is guess what? Zero. Your taxable income is zero. What will a lender allow you to do? A lender, a good lender at least, will add back the depreciation, that 50,000 to your taxable income, so that it's as if you made $50,000 profit again during the year. You didn't owe any taxes during that year, but you're still able to qualify for mortgages. So depreciation basically allows you to claim more tax deductions. Um, so if you have a real estate building, I highly encourage you to reach out to somebody like myself and my firm, and we can help you do a cost segregation study, which even allows you to go back in time in case you didn't do this. Now let's pause really quick. Got a few things on Facebook. Yeah. Appreciate you. Um, there for mentioning the LLC. Yeah. LLC typically is about 250 to file, um, to form in the state of Illinois. And is it correct to not put your name in the LLC name? Um, yeah, absolutely. You should not put your name in the LLC name because it can basically can hinder on the whole concept of having an LLC, like the, the privacy and then the asset protection. So yeah, just having something, I mean, unless it's a legacy. For example, my last name is typically on things because that's, that's the legacy that we, um, we started with the firm. So the Badu, um, Badu Enterprises is basically that. So in, in that sense, when you already have a brand, then that's fine. Um, and then let's see here. Um, yep, yep. Let's see, I focus more on businesses. Okay. Yep, absolutely. So basically real estate, um, if you own real estate, the, the common concept here, if you own real estate, you may not have to pay any income taxes on your real estate. Um, it is very possible. I, I know, remember, over 99% of my, of my current clients don't pay any taxes on income taxes, at least not property taxes, but income taxes on their real estate. Um, so that is something to keep in mind is that you ultimately don't have to, like if you're doing things the right way, you're taking advantage of tax deductions and loopholes on the real estate income itself, your profit, you will not have to pay any income taxes on it. Trust me. Now you might be wondering, okay, I've claimed all this depreciation like that real estate agent, now her basis, we call it basis, basically um, the deduction that she has left is only 50,000. Well, what if she sells it the next year? Maybe she got tired of the house, the tenant destroyed everything and she sells it for 100,000. Well, she would have a $50,000 taxable income and most of that would have to be what's called recaptured and taxed at the full ordinary income tax rate. Bit complicated. But basically, there are ways to sell your, your, your real estate tax-free. One way is through the homeowner's exclusion. Um, homeowner's exclusion basically is that if you live in the property two years before you sell it. So let's say you, let's say you live in the house um, in 2018, from 2018, 2019, 2020, you sold it in 2020. Well, you can sell it tax-free, meaning that up to $250,000 of the gain so let's say you bought a house for five hundred thousand, you sold it, um, or you bought it for two fifty thousand, you sold it for five hundred thousand, and you're a single individual. You don't pay any income taxes on that as long as you lived in there for two years. Um, and then also, let's say you're married. I always encourage my clients to get married because there are a lot of tax benefits to marriage. Um, you know, so the benefits double typically. So instead of 500, instead of 250,000 as an exclusion, it's now 500,000 if you both live in the property um, two years, basically two years before you sold the property. So it can be pretty sweet. You can sell a house 
up to two hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars in profit, income minus expenses, tax free. And then ten thirty one exchange, ten thirty one exchange. Basically, to keep it simple, you're trading one property for another. Instead of you paying taxes on the profit of that property that you sold, as long as you reinvest the money into a new property within a set period of days, namely 180 days or so, then you get to sell it tax-free, basically. Um, and yes, this works on all types of real estate. So what I'm saying here works on multifamily, land, residential, uh, commercial, you know, with the homeowner's exclusion, of course, it is only for residential properties. Um, but the 1031 exchange, you're just trading one property for another. Instead of paying the taxes now, um, you're basically reinvesting the money into another property. That's the simplest way to, to keep it. I won't go through the nuances of 45 days and 180 days and all that. No, it's not needed for this segment. Um, but then you also have opportunity zones. Opportunity zones, I call it the simpler version of the 1031 exchange. An opportunity zone allows you to reinvest any profits from any source. So stocks, um, unless it's a business, but basically stocks, real estate. Let's say you made a lot of money in the stock market or you sold a property, you flipped the property for a huge gain. By the way, 1031 exchange is only for rental properties. But let's say that you sold, you flipped the property and you're looking to buy another property. You would, you would go into what's called an opportunity zone. An opportunity zone is essentially a zone that's um, designated by your county. So for example, Inglewood in the city of Chicago um, is an opportunity zone where you can buy a property over there. As long as you improve, you significantly improve that property. So maybe you bought a fixer upper, you improved it, and you use the money that you made from the, the sale or the gain towards that. Well, you can defer the taxes um, for up to about 10 years or so. There are changes and um, a lot of specifics with that. But basically, you can defer, meaning you don't have to pay any taxes now. You can defer it into the future. Um, and then, you know, at some point, you will have to pay the taxes, but then you can always, there's always ways, you, uh, methods and things of that nature you can find to further defer the taxes through trusts and things of that nature. Next is a monetized installment sale. Way too complicated to go over, but let's just say, instead of selling the building and you're, you're um, basically, instead of selling it to a third party, you're gonna sell it to a bank and then the bank sells it to a third party. The reason for this is the bank is going to give you a loan. They're gonna give you the proceeds up to 96%. They'll give you the proceeds. So if you're looking to sell, but you don't wanna pay any taxes and you don't want to get into another property, you do a monetized installment sale where you sell the building and basically you, um, you get up to 96% of the proceeds minus closing costs and all that. Um, the bank gives you the money and then what would happen is after the bank gives you the money and now you have to pay monthly payments, well, there will be another bank, basically, that will say, okay, well, you're selling us the building for, so you, you basically have two banks. One bank that's, that you're going to sell the building to and then there's another bank that essentially um, going to give you a loan. So you have two banks. You pay one bank, so each month, you, let's just say you pay $1,000 to one bank, but then you receive 1000 from another bank. It cancels out to zero. Ultimately, it allows you to have your cash up to, 96, up to 96% in your pocket from the date of the sale, basically on that day. And then you don't have to pay any taxes until the loan is due, which will be in 30 years if you're still alive by then. Um, so that's a monetized installment sale. It's extremely complicated structure. Uh, which, you know, we do specialize in, in monetizing installment sales. But basically, you can get up to 96% of the proceeds up front, tax-free, essentially. Um, then you have the Charitable Remainder Trust, or the Charitable LLC for short. It's not typically recommended, but basically, you can gift up to 99% of your shares in a, a building. You keep 1%. The trust or the nonprofit sells it tax-free, Right? The moment or the moment you give the building to the nonprofit, it gets marked, um, it goes to evaluation. So you get a tax deduction for whatever the value is minus a discounted rate. So you get an upfront tax deduction. And then <clears throat> basically what you can do is you can set up like life insurance policies, annuities, things of that nature 
where you can reap the benefits of that money. So let's say you didn't truly want to give up that money. Um, you want to maintain some benefits. You can still do that. It's highly, highly complicated. It's probably the most complicated thing on the planet um, when, as it relates to taxes. This is like the king of all tax items. So I won't go through it too in depth, but the general concept is you sell or you, I'm sorry, you gift the building, you gift shares in the building to a nonprofit. And the moment you give the gift of the shares, you get a tax deduction. You can still keep the building, still make your, um, still collect rent and everything like that, or you can sell it. And then whatever the building is sold for, it goes into a bank account that also has your name on it. Anytime something has your name on it, it, um, it basically allows you to uh, reap some benefits. Basically, you can set up life insurance. You can do a loan to yourself. You can do a lot of things. Um, what's up, Nico? Long time no speak. She said, can you give it to your own nonprofit? Yes, that's what Mark Zuckerberg actually did um, with Facebook. He actually gifted all his Facebook shares into his, his own nonprofit. Um, the only thing he didn't get is the tax deduction up front, but think about how much Facebook is worth now. So his charitable remainder trust or his charitable LLC is reaping all the benefits of Facebook. All his shares are basically in the name of his trust. Um, and then same thing with you know, Elon Musk does not own Tesla. Elon Musk trusts, his trust fund owns Tesla. So that, when you see a lot of these things, it's, you have to have a billionaire's mindset. If you want to become a billionaire, think like a billionaire. We don't do things in our personal names. Um, we don't, we don't co-mingle. We, we ultimately take advantage where we can. All these billionaires, they're not paying a whole lot of taxes, right? But they're still making a big impact in society. What can you use in order to um, basically keep track of this stuff is QuickBooks. Yeah, I, I see a lot of the wows and the woes. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, th just so you know, a lot of these billionaires don't necessarily pay income taxes, right? Bill Gates used to have a dollar salary because he had everything going through his trust, everything going through his stocks and all that good stuff. I mean, it's the code. Anytime you have rules, as long as you play by the rules and as long as you can read in between the lines, you will win this game called life. Um, and you will win the tax game as well. Um, so the reason why they're still wealthy to this day is because they get to keep, right? When it comes to money, it's not about how much you make. It's about how much you keep. They're consistently keeping the money. They're reinvesting it into you know, income producing assets and trusts and things. I mean, their kids, kids, their kids, 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 20 kids a year, you know, 20 kids, 20 generations later are still going to be good because they've built so much wealth to the point where, I mean, they just have infinite, you know, they have infinite wealth basically. Um, and then Nico said, what about when you want to purchase what income is used? Um, not, do you mind clarifying the question? I don't fully understand the question, but, um, uh, before that, let's, let's wrap up with the QuickBooks. So QuickBooks is the software that we use to keep track of this stuff. So remember, we've learned today that you can get away with not paying income taxes legally, as long as you have your things in order. How do you keep your things in order is you have something like QuickBooks. This is not the place to cut corners here. If you want to think like the billionaires, if you want to think like the rich, you need to make sure you're doing things right. I get clients all the time. Can I do a spreadsheet? Can I do a napkin? Well, if you want napkin money, then go ahead and do napkin money, right? So it, when it comes to wealth, the trajectory is based off how, how wealthy you want to be. If you take yourself serious and if you're doing these things, you will become very, very wealthy. You'll be ultra wealthy and you'll protect everything that you own. So QuickBooks is what we use in order to keep track of our books. Even if we have a property manager, we still use QuickBooks. We have a bookkeeper um, who's handling the books, or if we're skilled in, in bookkeeping, then we can try to do it on our, on our own, which I don't usually recommend that. Um, but QuickBooks allows you to automatically download and categorize transactions, participate in online billing, create professional looking invoices and estimates, upload receipts through your phone, Create customized financial reports, which you should be looking at on a monthly basis, and if applicable, track inventory. The pros of QuickBooks is that it's a full-blown accounting software, uh, meaning that you can you can have it like the great the, the greats of the greats just by spending 10 to $10 $15 a month. You have a full-blown accounting software at your fingertips. 
has a nice professional look and feel. It's the best software hands down in the industry. Um, plenty of discounts offered if you're utilizing somebody like myself who is a certified QuickBooks Pro Advisor. And I'm also on the council or the board of Intuit. Um, so that's, that's one thing to keep in mind. And then it saves business owners a ton of time. And I mean tons of time. The cons is that it does require some extensive training. Um, if you really want to get the feel of it, go through some training, maybe an hour or two. Nothing too crazy, but I would say it is more extensive than your typical um, software. So with that being said, um, here's my, I'm gonna leave my contact information on the Zoom. Um, or let me just say it, you know, basically phone number 773-679-7198. Once again, 773-679-7198. Please do not call that number now. Um, and then, or you can call it, you just get to uh, my, re my receptionist team. Or you can email me at jb at buddyutaxservices.com. Now let's get to a few questions. Question here is, if all of your income allocated to real estate, um, charities or investments, how do you qualify to buy most investments? Well, that's a great question, is that the bank will look at the charity as if it's your, I mean, so, <clears throat> Remember, this one is for the ultra wealthy, typically. And with a bank, a smart bank knows that Bill Gates can afford mortgage payments, right? A smart bank knows not to use something as silly as debt to income ratio um, or take that into deep consideration. If Bill Gates came to them and says, hey, let me, um, let, you know, let me, let me go ahead and buy this property and I'm looking for a loan. I mean, they're probably gonna push Bill Gates' application through immediately. They're not gonna say, oh, hey, Bill Gates, 99% of your wealth is tied into a charity. We can't give you this loan, you know? So it, it's not, I mean, if you're thinking about it from a practical sense, then usually a bank, a good bank knows how to read, basically. They know how to read in between the lines. They're not like hardcore. Like if you're using a commercial loan, commercial loans are very flexible. They don't go off traditional, you know, Fannie Mae and all, all these other, um, type of deals, they, they typically go off their own sort of standards. Um, so that's, I would say, usually that charitable remainder trust co component is at the level when you're at the ultra wealthy level. So when, you be, when you're a billionaire or when, when you're at the point where you literally cannot like afford to pay taxes or you, I mean, you can, but you don't really want to. Um, so, but we can chat more about that, Nico. We can certainly chat off the line about that. Question is, if you want to buy property but gift it to your child, can their name be on a mortgage if their income is not used? Typically not. So to keep it simple, no, you, you would not put the child on a mortgage. You would just um, create a trust for that child. Or you make the, you create a trust, you put the property in the trust, and you make the beneficiary of the trust yourself, and then the secondary beneficiary of the trust, your kid. Um, or it goes you, your spouse, and then the kid. A question here, um, when you said never own a real estate in your name, what do you mean by that? Whose name would it be under? It's the land trust or the LOC. Um, preferably a land trust. If you can't do a land trust, then it's the LOC. And then question, is your is it your attorney that helps you set up the quick claim deed land trust? Yes, absolutely. Do not try any of this at home. Anything you're listening to today, do not. And I repeat, do not try it at home. You must have an attorney to set up your land trust. You must have an accountant to get your books and records clean and straight and do your taxes at the end of the year. Do not, do not, do not try any of this stuff at home. This is just information. This is general information. Um, it gets much more specific when you talk to an accountant or when you talk to an attorney. They'll give you the, the specifics, the nuances and everything like that. Um, and just to reiterate that whole quick claim deed due on sale, it's very unlikely to happen um, just because you're still on the hook for the loan no matter what. And then, so for the title of the LLC, it would be the address. Yep. Yeah, so basically, the way we name our real estate is, well, first of all, the land trust has a number assigned to it. So the owner of the real estate is actually the land trust title number. And then the LLC is usually the address of the property, comma, LLC. Um, you can take away the zip code and the city and the state and all that. And then question is, are most, um, says, are most commercial loans 
through banks or are there more popular retail um, retail commercial lenders? Yeah, they're usually through banks. So commercial loans are usually through banks, um, but there are some private lenders. You do have to be careful with those because, you know, it's, um, I mean, they're, most of them are legit, but at the same time, hopefully you don't get scammed. So for me, I still use banks. Um, I'll give you one full disclosure. Wintrust is the company that we use for our mortgages currently on the commercial loans. They're pretty good. And if you need a contact at Wintrust, I can certainly refer you to somebody. Um, and then question is, will this video be saved for later viewing? Yes, it will be. Um, yes, yes, it will be. Absolutely. And then question here from Evie he says, do any of your clients use, let's see, do any of your clients use SEP IRAs or mostly solo 401ks? Do you recommend any solo 401k providers? I mean, yeah, some of my clients do use 401ks. Um, to be honest, most of my clients utilize tools such as life insurance as a wealth building tool. We use 401ks as a secondary, but we own, at a minimum, we max out the Roth IRAs every year. We also max out the, um, the health savings account or HSAs. But if you're looking for long-term progressive wealth, life insurance is a tool that can really take you to the next level. Uh, we call it our premium financing if you qualify. If you need more details on that, please feel free to let me know. Providers, TD Ameritrade is very good. Um, you know, there, there, there's light, there are lots and lots of providers out there that do a pretty good job at this stuff. Um, looks like we have time for maybe one more question. Yep, there, appreciate it. Boy, I said, really needed this insight, great information. So we got, we got time for one more question. We'll leave two minutes um for one more question if you're on zoom you can feel free to unmute yourself um, or type in a chat box if you're on facebook you can just type in a chat box this is recorded meaning that it will be available um for later use and it will be posted on my youtube channel as well uh, we do have that last question here and if you if you have any questions outside of this then you can feel free to contact me my phone number is 773-679-7198 once again, 773-679-7198. Um, you can email me at either basically jeffbadu at gmail.com. Check out my website, jeffbadu.com. So we can feel free to go after the fact. Nico said, Jeff, you need to go live in my group of 18K people. Yes, please invite me. Let's set up something, Nico. Um, and then Daryl said, that life insurance tip, is that what universal term? It's typically universal. That's, that's the secret behind that. And Bill Gates and the, the wealthy, these are the tools that they use. They just don't tell you about it, typically. They only tell you about the stock they own. They don't tell you about the, the wealth building tools they use. And then Vashal says, when you sign a contract, the title or deed should be your name. No, it should not. It should be the land trust. So Chicago title, land trust number 12345 should be the only individual that owns the property. Not you personally. Night or even your LLC, unless they don't allow you to do the land trust. Some companies won't allow you to do a land trust. So at a minimum, you do the LLC. Do not put the property in your personal name. Don't sign the title. Don't do anything that has your personal name next to it if you can. Um, last question here. I was told that um, through an LLC, you have to jump through more hoops and hurdles for approval. Um, so yes, if... If you're doing a residential loan, if you're doing a personal loan, then yes, you will go through hoops to close an LLC. I do know lenders that will allow you to close an LLC as long as it's not a primary residence loan, right? But even then, if, if they don't allow you to close an LLC, after closing, talk to your lender, state it up front, you do a quick claim deed so that you ultimately transfer the title into the LLC, basically. So it looks like we're out of time. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, check out my website, jeffbaidu.com. There's tons of this information already on there, by the way. Um, but let me go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you all for tuning in today. Hope you guys enjoyed and learned something. Um, we'll be in touch. And hope you guys have a great 4th of July weekend. Thank you.